Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, happy seventh Sunday of Easter, everybody. Yes, I know, it's also Mother's Day. A blessed Mother's Day to everyone. I was uh, looking up, how did Mother's Day actually start? Uh, And it's a really interesting story. Uh, The first Mother's Day was in Grafton, West Virginia, and was celebrated on May 8th, 1908. Mrs. Ann M. Jarvis was honored by her daughter, Mrs. Anna Maria Jarvis. Her mother, back in the mid-19th century, had started up these mothers' groups. They were work clubs to mobilize the mothers of their local communities to fight against the problems of disease and poor health and improper sanitation. The same things that had killed five of her seven children. When the Civil War broke out, There were a number of border states and towns in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Maryland, and they had this mixed support between those who supported the Union and those who supported the Confederation. The Union Army moved into those border states and set up army camps. And within time, they started having their own issues with disease like typhoid and measles. And the general went to Mrs. Jarvis and he said, would you be able to help care for these soldiers who were ill? And she mobilized her clubs and they cared for the sick. And at the end of the war, they received the highest commendations for their wartime service. After the war, you had all of these soldiers now that were going to return to their homes and to their local communities, some who had served in the Union Army, others in the Confederate Army. And it was a a time where local communities were a little nervous especially in those border states. They were bracing themselves for the feuds and the hatred that would continue now at this local level that had been going on for years at the national level. Mrs. Jarvis conceived of an idea where her mother's work clubs would, in the words that he used back in those days, would kick the devil downstairs. She worked with local county authorities to announce the formation of a new celebration in 1868 called a Mother's Friendship Day. The concept was simple. You were to bring all of your family, regardless of what army they served in, and come together for a community celebration of mothers. The first one, you can imagine, it was a rather split decision. As people gathered, those that served in the Union Army went to one side, and those that served in the Confederate Army went to the other side, and it looked like it was just going to be a continuation of the division that the country had seen for over four years. There was a platform that was set up with a band, and Mrs. Jarvis, along with one of her co-leaders, came out to speak to the people. She was dressed in union colors, the blues, And her co-leader was dressed in the grays of the Confederate Army. She explained 
the meaning of Mother's Friendship Day and invited the crowd to sing Way Down South in Dixie. And it was quite popular for half the crowd. Mrs. Jarvis's confederately dressed co-leader invited the crowd to join her in singing the Star-Spangled Banner. And when that was completed, two little girls also dressed in the blue and in the gray took the hands of Mrs. Jarvis and her co-leader and put them hand in hand and invited them to embrace. And then they invited the crowd, the mixed crowd, to embrace each other as the band struck up an old anxiety. The day ended in peace and reconciliation. Mrs. Jarvis continued her work with the Mother's Clubs the rest of her life until she died in 1905. And at her funeral, her daughter made a pledge that she would establish a memorial to Mother's Friendship Day. It began appropriately enough in the churches and the communities that her mother served. And it was through her great advocating that in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson signed a resolution confirming and setting aside the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. And now, as Paul Harvey used to say, you know the rest of the story. Good day. It's not a week that goes by that I don't think of my own mother who passed away eight years ago this week. I miss her. I miss her smile. I miss being able to call up and ask for a recipe. I miss asking her questions about our family history. I always knew my mom was there for me, teaching me to tie my shoes, playing catch in the front yard, blowing on the methylade when I had scraped my knee, helping with my homework, getting to my various sports practices, and feeding me if it was something that I didn't like. I was lucky that I had a dog that liked all different kinds of food. I resonate with the words of Mark Twain. My mother had a great deal of trouble with me, but I think she enjoyed it. When I was growing up, cars had seat belts, but nobody used them. That's what your mom was for. And my mother was my seat belt. If we had to stop quickly, she would put out her arm, and like one a super, a Marvel superhero today, she could hold me back. It was amazing. She protected me, and so I gave her the nickname Mama Bear, a name that we have shared in our family since then. She was my own personal superhero. And I always knew I had a place to belong. And she prepared me for the world and sent me on my way with love. Our gospel reading for today is a part of what we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. Here Jesus is revealing his unique relationship with God the Father. And it too is all about belonging. It's not like the prayer of the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, but this is an open conversation with God about his followers. 
And it expresses Jesus' deep desire to return to the Father for the destiny and for the destiny of his chosen ones. Jesus is asking God to grant the believers the same kind of unity that he enjoys with God his Father from eternity, a unity of love. They are yours, Jesus prays. There's a particular relationship of love and intimacy and obedience and faith and dependence and joy and and peace and blessing and fruitfulness that binds the disciples together in this fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus prays that God will keep his followers in faithfulness so that they may be one. His prayer is a prayer of protection that God would watch over his chosen ones. And that is really a part of the nature of God. We see it in the scriptures from the beginning to the end. In Genesis with Abraham where God says, don't be afraid, I will give you strength all the way through to Revelation. Where God says, I will make all things new. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, giving water to the thirsty. God is always been about protecting his people. The prophets shared it, like Isaiah, that God would be a shelter from the heat of the day, a refuge and a protection from the storm, or Jeremiah, is anything too hard for God? He asks rhetorically. And in the Psalms, the singers of our tradition singing to the rock and fortress and deliver a mighty fortress is our God, they sing. A shield of salvation and a stronghold that you and I can count on. The Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And writing to Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Doesn't mean that bad things won't happen to us. God's promise, though, is that they cannot overcome us. With God's love and protection, like a mother, we stand before the world as blessed. They are yours, Jesus says. At the end of the high priestly prayer, Jesus asks for God to sanctify his disciples for a holy purpose. As Jesus was sanctified and sent into the world, so we are sent by Jesus himself into the world to share the love and the grace that he gave. We're to make a place where all of God's beloved may belong. That vision of Jesus was also the vision of Mrs. Jarvis to create a place of love, reconciliation, and peace. The time is now for us to follow in that great tradition of offering safe spaces for our brothers and sisters in our community, a place where love may abound. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.